part of our afternoon session, our, our second plenary session of 13th Hancock Symposium. Uh, very excited to see all of you again. We have a really uh, fantastic plenary speaker today, uh, Professor Barry Bumgardner, Professor of Education at Westminster College, is, gonna in, is going to introduce our symposium plenary number two speaker. Barry. I've not had anybody call me by my whole name in a long time. I'm just Dr. Bum. All right, so our plenary speaker, um, her job title pretty much tells you everything you need to know about her. She is a chief curiosity officer, which I think I would like that job. Um, perhaps her session title, which you can see up there, tells you a bit more about her. Um, even more fun, though, are her hobbies. Aside from having been a bohemian artist, yes, she is a duck, a wildcat. She loves thinking about learning in different ways. She thinks it's rad. Those are her words, not mine. I'm still trying to bring Groovy back. She is interested in hashtag deeper learning, hashtag design thinking, craftivism, crows, and the Oxford comma. I think I'd really like to teach with her. Her Instagram name, at Moonbeam Machine, has a story about it, and I think you all should ask her about it tomorrow in the morning session. I hear it's maybe not quite appropriate for her plenary, but I'm not sure. Um, what led her to where she is now started with a professor in grad school who said, you don't know a thing about education, but you ask great questions. Um, she and Barbara Kerr surely have a lot to talk about, I think, after this morning's session. But she has taken um, innovation to a whole new level by working for the University of Kentucky from her home in Oregon. That's a sweet gig. She has been truly epic. She was the director for policy and innovation at the Educational Policy Improvement Center, EPIC, epic. Um, she worked with the Next Generation Accountability Systems and among other things, digital learning communities, like having iPads. How cool is that? So we really like her. Sarah has a Bachelor of Science degree and a Master's in Public Administration, both from the University of Oregon, hence the duck. Um, please help me in welcoming vintage t-shirt collector, Sarah Lynch. Hey, y'all. Can you hear me? Um, I'd like to go ahead and apologize to the lighting gentleman as well as the cameraman because I'm going to move around a little bit. And I'm wearing cute orange pants. I'm not going to stand at a podium and not let you see the pants. Um, good afternoon. It's so warm in here. Can't you feel it? It's very warm. Um, so I'm a little nervous. And it's not because I'm not used to doing speaking gigs. I actually do large... Uh, public presentations pretty often, but what's different is that I'm used to talking to a lot of education wonks, like policymakers, researchers, um, district superintendents, like people who I can use a lot of jargon with and sort of feel important and expert and like exert my expertise with words that nobody ever really defines. And so it's a little, a little nerve wracking to stand in front of a group of students. But that's why I came here, really. That was the exciting reason to come to Missouri, to be able to connect and see students learning, because this is the work that I'm supposed to be engaged in every day, is working for innovation and education. And from what I can see, Westminster College is killing it on the innovation front. Um, so a little bit about myself before I jump in. So I am the Chief Curiosity Officer at the Center for Innovation and Education. So that sounds pretty cool. What the heck does that mean? So the Center for Innovation and Education, we are working on wicked problems in public schools. Uh, thinking about the fact that the goals that we name for our students don't, in terms of t our testing and accountability systems, they don't match up to what we know students need to be able to know, need to know and be able to do when they leave high school, right? Things like collaboration, creativity, self-directed learning, these things aren't named and honored and assessed as goals. And they certainly aren't taught as goals in our public education system. And so we think deeply about that as a design problem, right? Um, I'll, show you, I'll go ahead and skip ahead to my next slide because it's got the good tweetable quote that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. 
and we don't think the results that our public education system are producing right now are that, that great. So fundamentally, our work is design work. And as Chief Curiosity Officer, my job is really to hold up a learning agenda. What are the deep questions we're looking to solve? Before we assert solutions, how do we find great, innovative, bright lights out in the country, connect them together as networks, let people learn from one another? Because innovation is sort of messy. It rarely goes off as you plan. And we need to be able to learn forward in our innovative work, especially in public education. We're learning institutions, but we so often aren't very good about learning about our own work. And so that's a lot of my job. I convene learning networks, both virtually and in person, of people who are trying to do really interesting stuff to change the way people, students, experience public school every day in the United States. Um, so it's a pretty good gig. And it's a, I tell you that first. OK, so it's a lot of design work for students. I think we kind of do a terrible job about talking about careers to students, children, young adults, about the world of work. We sort of have like a village people approach to thinking about careers. You guys know who the village people are? Is that just like over your head? Like you're either a doctor or you're a lawyer or you're a police officer and it's like this costume you eventually put on. But the world of work is so much more complicated and broad and exciting. And so I share the kind of work I do because I had no idea that this even existed, right? I thought I went to political science. I thought I was gonna, I don't know, maybe go to law school. I don't know, but there was like what, I didn't know what costume to put on and there was like a career track that I was supposed to follow, but there are no career tracks in the 21st century and I just encourage you all to dig deep and when you meet people who have interesting jobs, ask them about it. Um, so that's the one reason, that's my little side note. The other reason I say is that my work, when Barbara was talking today, I was like, wow, my work really is creative work. That I'm an artist at heart, but I get to apply it in a really kind of design thinking mode to problems of public education. So, here we go. We heard Barbara say this, after, this morning that they were in the midst of a creativity crisis, right? That creativity is in high demand. In fact, when you look at any sort of list published by Forbes magazine or like the World Economic Forum, creativity is always listed as one of the top skills that, that workers are going to need to succeed in the future. Top three skills, the World Economic Forum put it in the top three skills, yet what we're seeing is that there's been a sharp decline in creativity among our students since 1990, and even more so in the last 15 years or so. So what we heard is, we're in the midst of a creativity process, crisis. So like, what's up with that? So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today, about the imperative of cultiva cultivating the creative potential of every student in every school. But um, embedded in that, as the Chief Curiosity Officer, what are some of the questions we're gonna be answering? So first of all, what the heck is creativity and creative potential anyway? Why are most schools currently not designed for creativity? What are some of the bright spots and strategies for more creative students, teachers, classrooms, and systems? And lastly, what the heck is the toothbrush test? Did you all see the title of my talk as Beyond the Toothbrush Test? Okay, and I hope that kind of made you curious. Like, what the heck is the toothbrush test? Well, I'm so glad you asked, because we're gonna do and talk about the toothbrush test. So, the toothbrush test is like my sort of slang word for the Torrance test of creative thinking, and Barbara talked about it this morning. It's the assessment that actually gives us the data set that says students' creativity have been, has been declining since the 1990s, but it's actually been the standard bearer in assessing creativity in children since the 1960s. So when, doesn't that kind of raise a question of like, how the heck do you assess creativity? I'd like to give you a sort of a peek into how that might work but I'm gonna put a little creative spin on it because it's the afternoon and this is a symposium about creativity, so you gotta do it. Um, so with that, are you guys ready to take the toothbrush test? Maybe. Lukewarm answers. Um, so I'm gonna need four very brave, bold volunteers to come up on stage. All right, you raise your hand. I see you had to, come on. There we go. Four, we got two coming. One there, one there. All right, come on in. Who, I need four. Stand up. Come at it. All right. Yes. All right. Can you give a round of applause for our volunteers?
Okay, so it's like this hippie chick comes from Oregon. She's talking about toothbrushes. I'm like, big trust to come up on stage. So what's your name? I'm Shafa. Shafa? Michael. Michael? Dalton. Cole. Cole. All right, here we go. Um, so how many of, before we do the toothbrush test with these four volunteers, um, how many of you use Twitter? Right? How many of you have Twitter on your phone? Oh, you know what you just did? You just volunteered to take the toothbrush test too. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. You guys ready? You listening? So I'm gonna give, I'm gonna set up and offer up an example of a question that would come on the Torrance test of creative, the Torrance creative test or whatever it's called. Um, oh, that went backwards. All right, so you guys, I mean, oh, oh shoot, I gotta get your supplies. All right, I have, I have supplies. So the test question is, what are some unusual ways you might use a toothbrush? All right, so take a program and a pen, and I'm gonna give you guys two minutes to generate as many interesting and creative answers. Yeah, keep it as a secret. Well, you guys are on a team. I just decided you're on a team, and you guys are on a team. All right, so now you guys are playing at home alone, at home too, right? So you have your Twitter, and I would really love for you to come up with your most creative answer to what are some unusual ways to use a toothbrush and tweet it at me. Can you see that? It says at Sarah Lynch, and use the hashtag toothbrush test so that everybody else can see it. So then you, you know how Twitter works. Like they might not know, but like, you know, you just click on the hashtag and you see everyone who's saying that. And I hope it doesn't have some other meaning in social media world, because I didn't check that. Um, so the way we're gonna do this is um, we're gonna have our volunteers, our teams, uh, present their answers in sort of a rap battle uh, fashion, sort of like a cipher for those, like the official term for it. And um, so the way ciphers work is they're gonna sort of stand and they're gonna go back and forth and give their best creative answers, but you all have an important role to play here because the audience is part of a cipher. Like when you hear something you like, you gotta say, oh, or yeah, or clap, or just like pity clap of like, yeah, that was a little awkward. But you all have a role here and it's gonna feel better and more exciting the more enthusiasm you give to our toothbrush test rap battle cipher. Um, and it's just like really courageous for them to come up on stage. How's it going dudes? You got it? You need a little more time? All right. What do you guys, are you guys tweeting at me? I gotta check my phone. Oh, awesome. I'm getting, I've got four so far. I saw lots of hands go up saying they have Twitter. I want to see lots of really great answers for creative ways to use a toothbrush, but keep it clean, kids. Literally. All right? Are you ready? Are you guys ready? Okay. <laughs> um, so stand up. Did you hear we're going to do it in the fashion of a rap battle? So we're going to go back and forth. So I'm going to get You guys ready? All right, but they're going to give you lots of enthusiasm. Okay, can I get a round of applause? Are you guys really excited? So what are some unusual ways to use a toothbrush? You guys are first. Okay. Just one. Just one? Yeah. Uh, draw or paint. Ah, very nice. Very nice. Okay, good. Back scratcher. Okay. A back scratcher. Oh. Okay. Uh, cleaning things off the floor. Cleaning things on the floor. Very well done. Okay. Uh, Clean out your dusty fan. Cleaning out your dusty fan. Yeah! There's your homie back there. He's cheering you on. Okay, ready? What else? Uh, we, we have a bunch. He was saying we'll stick it to a rowboat. I don't know why. You could use this as a robot arm. A, a robot arm. A robot arm. There you go. That is very creative. Come on, that was a very creative answer. I need some creativity, enthusiasm. Okay. Uh, scrub like rings and stuff. Like, 
to scrubbing rings to clean jewelry. Yeah, that's very good. That's very good. Okay, we're gonna do one more. Uh, oh, do you have one, one more? Do you have one more? Used to like use it to sculpt. To sculpt. Oh, you're very artistic with the paintbrushes. All right, that was wonderful. Now, did anyone come up with like kind of a crazy idea for their toothbrush? All right, you can you shout it? I'll check my tweets. Thanks. All right. Okay. First of all, I want to give an incredible, you know what I didn't do? And I think this was the problem is that I didn't give you all your props. So you're going to do one more. Okay. But you got to use the toothbrush in order to act it out. Okay. You ready? One more answer. <laughs> Brush your teeth. Oh. Oh, not so creative, but unusual. It depends on what your teeth are. All right, here we go. Do I yeah. do it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you so much to our volunteers. You guys are awesome, and I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Win toothbrushes. So, uh, you know, this is about creative risk taking, and I didn't know how that was going to go. So, um, where are my answers at here? Who has mentioned me? What are some good of the, some of the other answers? Uh, a sensory product? You could use a toothbrush to clean another toothbrush. Shout out to Destry Ekman. Um, to clean your shoes, brush the frizz out your hair, clean the floor. Whoa, I'm not gonna say that one. Claire Whitehouse, I see you. I don't see you, but I see you. Oh, I love this. RJ Mays, where's RJ Mays? Oh, what up, RJ? So RJ sent me a GIF for uh, a toothbrush using to scratch some cute small animal. I don't know, is that a gremlin? I don't know what that is. Is that a mouse? But it's like a, it's a monkey. So that would be, that, when I first took the toothbrush test, that was my first answer. I was like, it's a back scratcher for a tiny little mouse. Um, so those were awesome, and I encourage you all to check your Twitter, check hashtag toothbrush test to see some of the other creative answers people gave. So the way, like, what the heck does that even mean? Like, how does that even become a measure of creativity? So the toothbrush test is one example of a kind of task that really looks at divergent thinking. Like you have a known object that has a known use, and it asks people and asks the test taker to kind of expand, all, expand their possibilities of what could be. And so the way the Torrance test assess answers for the many use questions, like how, many, how could you use a toothbrush, is they look at fluency, like how many answers did you generate? Flexibility, like how many different categories of things did you come up with? Like really practical art tools, like back scratchers for little cute monkeys. Like how elaborate, uh, how diverse were your answers? And how original were they? Were they truly unique? Or did they have something that was, would, would it be an answer that you might expect? And then the other piece is the elaboration. And I do apologize to my volunteers on stage. I was going to give you each a toothbrush, because I do find that when you're holding a toothbrush, you have the opportunity to be a little bit more theatrical. You provide a little bit more detail to, ha to, to how you might provide your answer, and that's how people assess questions on this toothbrush test. So this is how we get answers. On, this is how we get the data that says creativity is declining in our students. What do you guys think about that? So we know that divergent thinking is part of creativity, but it's not the whole of it right? It's not the toothbrush test. That was kind of a ridiculous exercise that I made them go through in front of all of their classmates. And that's not the whole of creativity. So, like, what the heck is that? So, some researchers who specialize in creativity actually were like, you know, for creativity specialists, we aren't very good at defining it. In fact, they looked at, like, the largest collection of research and studies on creativity, and only a third of these experts in their articles and in their books go so far as to provide a definition of creativity. Like a third of the creativity experts are avoiding the question of what is creativity anyway. But we have a sense, right? We have some sort of mental picture, like that it, it becomes some beautiful flash 
that it is something exquisite, if not mystical, but something that's incredible, right? But like, how do we define it exactly? So let's go to Mr. Toothbrush Test himself to start. So he did define it. He defined um, the, the more around the creative process of becoming sensitive to or aware of problems or gaps, bringing together available information, searching for solutions, and communicating the results. Well, that's interesting. That does not necessarily look like that. It looks more like, that kind of sounds more like a scientific process than these kind of brilliant flashes that come from nowhere that only certain people can endow. This seems like an intentional, exquisite uh, enterprise that creativity is described here as. So Jonathan Plucker, another expert, says, creativity is the interaction among aptitude, process, and environment by which an individual or group Interesting that creativity can actually be a shared experience and not just the lone artist. Uh, an individual or group, or group produces a perceptible product that is both novel and useful as defined within a social context. So the thumbs up means, uh, indicates is that social context, that it's defined, uh, that it's useful as defined in a social context, that creative work has an audience, that it's not just work that you do to yourself, but that your creativity is only reflected back when people find it useful or valuable. So we're going to talk a little bit about these guys, James Kaufman and Rong Baghetto. And they didn't really do much effort to create some very articulate definition of creativity. They said, you know what, we took a look around and most people agree what creativity is, is work that is both unique and valuable. That it has that social context, that it's valuable in some sense of the term, and it's not just some bizarre idea or zany idea. It has a use and a value. So Baghetto and Kaufman talk a lot about how people look at creativity, what kinds of creativity we investigate. And they, they saw that most people talk about two kinds of creativity. One is the sort of what they call the big C, the imminent genius. These truly creative change makers, people like Frida Kahlo, Isaac Newton, or James Baldwin, people who changed, they reflected their times and changed society the way we think, the way we experience science, the way we understand art and culture and gender and identity, the way we understand the black experience in America, like total game changers, imminent genius. What's the nature of that kind of creative inspiration and, create, and, and impact? And then people also look at little c creativity. Not the imminent genius, but like people like you and me. Like the kid who plays guitar on the street busking. It's like pretty cute. But he's only been playing a couple years, but like good for him. He's like, he's not Jimi Hendrix, but there's some creativity happening in the way he plays. Or even my friends Ross, James, up there and Scott Law, who are, who are professional musicians, that they tour all over the country. Now, then, they're not changed in rock and roll, but they play good rock and roll and they get paid for it. So little c creativity sort of encompasses both of these moments of every day, that they're not imminent geniuses, they're not changing society through their creative work, but there is creativity there. And so what Kaufman and Baghetto said is like, this doesn't really work as a model. Little c is too expansive. There's too much of a difference in understanding the creative motivations and the impacts of these two kinds that, these, that, that little c creativity encompasses. So what they propose is a 4C model of creativity. And this is important. Stay with me. I'm going to get there. So they, they proposed a level of pro-C creativity. Like, not the kid playing guitar at the mall, but these professional musicians who are doing their creative work and getting paid for it at a high level of proficiency. Or, you know, like a creative chemist working in a biochem lab that isn't Isaac Newton, but is making really important creative problem-solving contributions to a team or his organization. Like making important, using creativity in a professional way that, he's, that has been honed and skills that have been honed within a field over many, many years. And this is important. I'll bring it up later. Never mind. And then also, mini-C. So this is interesting. 
calling out many see these novel and personally meaningful interpretations and connections. So this isn't like we just talked about the thumbs up, the social validation or reflection back that's part of creativity being something that's both unique and valuable. But sometimes in these mini C moments, it's really not about anything outside of you. That you have these flashes, these connections, these moments that you make personally meaningful interpretations of the world or your experiences. And so I don't know if you can see this frame, but it's a, a drawing from like a second grader that says, this is Princess Heart. She is pink and blue, and her favorite color is purple. So that may not be even at a level of little c creativity, but it demonstrates a mini c moment of meaning making, where she's understanding the concept of how colors blend together and interpreting it through a story of this girl, the princess. So that's the meaningful kind of transformative learning flashes that happen. And that those are, according to Vigato and Kaufman, are in fact creativity. Now, so this is my four-year-old, Silas. He's at the aquarium. And if any of you spend a lot of time with four-year-olds, it kind of feels like their whole world is mini seas. Like that the more, that a lot of this work is like childlike connections that are silly and don't have any sort of value other than outside of their own just sort of experience and wonder of the world. But mini C creativity is not just for little kids. That many, we all experience mini C creative insights and moments and transformative learning every day. My friend Alec is a science teacher down in San Diego and he has a whole school structured around this very concept, what he calls understanding nerdy delight. Those things where you make the meaningful connection. So I'm learning how to play the ukulele. I'm not very good at it. And I, all the songs I try to play just sound like sad country songs, even though I'm happy and they aren't country. Um, but I had a mini C moment where I was like learning the chords and trying to figure it out. And I sing along, like I'm not going to sing here, but I had a moment where I figured out one line that fits with one chord and I sang it differently. And I had this mini C connection, this moment, this aha, where I understood that song and I understood how to sing over music in a way that like, it's not like I'm gonna go play at the mall now. I'm just sitting in my living room trying to play the ukulele, but I had that mini C moment of inspiration and it has influenced my learning and my progress ever since. Um, so there we go. So, why are we talking about all these C's, Sarah? Um, so the implications for creativity and education. So first of all, why are we thinking about these four C's? So the big C. The greatest works of creativity inspire and define our shared human experience. Creativity is not separate from the disciplines. It actually fuels them. That the creative change workers, the eminent geniuses, are the people we study that are forming the disciplines that we all take. So pro C, we are living in an era when professional creativity is in high demand with technological tools and connectivity and information to cultivate it. That this is the moment we are living in and it's so important for us to be recognizing professional level creativity and seeing it as um, something that is demanded and needs to be cultivated in our students as they work towards it. So little C, this is really important. Everyone, everyday creativity is that everyone has creative and potential. That this model breaks open this notion that creativity is just for some people and just for some kind of people. Maybe they're not all creative, eminent geniuses, but they're, you know, there's creative people and not so creative people. But Little C reminds us that we are all capable of working and being creative. And Lastly, the mini C creativity is that creativity is at its most micro level. It is learning. It's transformative learning. It's learning that becomes personal. Like I'm not just retaining these facts and memorizing them. Mini C creativity is when you make connections about the information you're receiving in the world and making, making something personally meaningful to you. And that is the most exciting kind of learning that you can do, right? Like think about the, the most energized you get when you are learning something. It's these transformative moments, not the learning that feels forced and you're just uh, trying to retain it. So lastly, in the 4C model tells us that this is actually developmental, that creativity is not a fixed trait. 
that it's malleable and it's teachable, that this is something that you could move from mini C to little C to pro C. Very few of us will ever get to the big C, but it's developmental, that it's something that is truly something that's capable to be focused on in schools. So there you go. I'm going to go home now. Um, so th that's the name of the talk. Is it, what are the 21st century imperatives for teaching creativity and education? Like, that's it. It's generated out of these four, this 4C model. So what the heck is going on in schools? So I could rattle off. I was actually going to make some props for you guys that had like stop signs with wonk on it instead of stop because I could rattle off a lot of policy issues that are preventing creativity from being put in schools, but I think it's better if I kind of explain it through a story. So when, you, when I tell you that creativity is being stifled in schools, some of you may be feeling like, hey, that's not really the case. I had a very creative education. And you're thinking about all these really creative opportunities you had, and you're like, I don't know if I really buy that there's a creativity crisis. And I'll say, I kind of agree. I had a really creative experience especially when I was in elementary school and middle school. I was part of a program where I would go and I would be wrestling with these really delicious, wicked problems. We'd do projects. I'd learn to code. There was never any set right answer that I was working towards. It was just like the most exciting work you could do. But it only happened to me once a week. Because, see, I was in a talent and a gifting program and I passed the toothbrush test. So like the Torrance exam, is often used to screen for students to be part of a talented and gifted program. So one day a week, I would literally get on a bus and go to a different school. And the other four days of the week, I would sit in a classroom um, next to two other people. So Jonathan Banks would sit there, Sarah Collins, and Jimmy Davis. So I don't know if you remember in elementary school, the teachers always put us in alphabetical order, like they would forget our names or something. I never really quite understood it. But that's it, John Banks. Sarah Collins, Jimmy Davis. We were in lots of classes together and we always sat together. And uh, we couldn't have been more different. So John Banks was really loud. Um, he was super charming. Um, he didn't look like me at all. He was an African-American boy. Uh, he lived with his grandmother. I knew his neighborhood did not look like my neighborhood. Um, but we connected because we both loved to draw and he loved to tell stories and I loved to listen to them. Uh, and Jimmy Davis. So Jimmy Davis was really quiet. He was kind of nervous. He fidgeted a lot. He actually, when he did talk, it was like, just felt like it was really hard for him to talk. We're like, wow, he's real, Jimmy's really shy. But you know what about Jimmy? He really loved to draw, too. <clears throat> but he only really liked to draw one thing. It was Garfield. And I don't know if you guys know that the Garfield, do you know what Garfield is? It's like an old comic. Well, the guy who made Garfield, Garfield, his name was Jim Davis. And Jimmy Davis somehow felt this resonance with Garfield, and he just drew Garfield all day long in all these different scenarios. So the three of us were in Mrs. Carlisle's class, and Mrs. Carlisle did not teach the way that I experienced on the Talent and Gift Day program. We did lots of workbooks. She loved a good workbook, but because of those public schools in the South, we couldn't, of course, write in the workbook. We had to look at the workbook and put it on another page. But, um, oh man, you guys, you know this workbook work stuff is so draining. It's not really learning, but like we were just not into it. And so what Jimmy, Jonathan, and I would do, and this is how we figured out that we all love to draw, is that we would sort of protest the workbooks by making by drawing on them and it started to become this very elaborate collective art experiment experiment where we would try to get different workbooks and add on our art to every single one like completely tagged it up with between the three of us these three kids and it was like it sort of started this sort of revolution like other kids started drawing on their workbooks and it's kind of a silly thing like what power does a fourth grader have other than to like um, put graffiti on school resources, as Mrs. Uh, Carlton would say. But uh, it was a pretty powerful moment of us kind of collectively collaborating when we weren't really friends and we couldn't have been more different. And it makes me think, right? That like, meanwhile, when I was once a week out of these re this really incredible school where I was getting you know, learning about environmental science and applying it into like real stream systems in my town, like really cool learning experience. And Jimmy and Jonathan were back at 
their classroom doing more workbooks. It's like, why? These guys are super creative. Why didn't they get to have that nourished? Well, I can tell you why. It's because they weren't identified for talented and gifted. I know that Jonathan really struggled with math and with reading, and Jimmy really struggled too. So Jonathan was really just sort of disinterested in the kind of reading materials that he was offered because all the books we read were about white, sassy girls. And he's like, what the heck is this again? Like none of it resonated with him, and he didn't feel seen by the teacher. And Jimmy, you know, my son is autistic, and I know lots of autistic people, and I've learned lots about autism, and now when I think about the way Jimmy fidgeted, the way he was really focused on uh, Garfield, the way he was really quiet, like Jimmy wasn't just shy, he was autistic. And so we had this kid with an incredible creative potential with a disability, and another student that was just so charming and just so powerfully charismatic, but for whatever reason, they had to sit and do those damn workbooks while I got to go to a different school. So this is not a knock on talented and gifted programs. They're really important, but it is a knock on like, why me? Why did I get my creativity cultivated and not them? When we all shared that potential and it was clearly demonstrated. So within this is there's an implicit message. And when we're thinking about that every system is per perfectly designed to get the results that it gets, then these are two fundamental design flaws that basic knowledge and skills in ELA and math are more important than the development of creativity and other 21st century skills, that Jimmy and Jonathan had to stay in that class and work on their workbooks, that they didn't have, they didn't have the right yet, they hadn't earned their right yet to do the creative problem-solving work that I was getting to do. And another design flaw, implicit message, is that students are incapable of growing in these kind of 21st century domains and basic English and math skills at the same time. Like, there, there's nothing in the, the learning sciences, nothing in cognitive science that confirms that belief, but that's the way we structure so many of our schools. And you guys are probably sitting there like, Chick, that was probably 25 years ago. And you're right, I'm 38 years old. Um, but this is still happening. Very much so. And it's actually happening in a more intense degree in the last 15 years and out of the public school systems that many of you came out of. So what's going on here? Why, are, what's, why is the story of Jenny, Jonathan, Jimmy, Jonathan, and me, the story of these three deaths, why is this a reflection back on our current situation in our public schools? And it has largely a, a, due to the way we define and measure success in our education systems. That the way we define and measure success in our education systems are built on, based off of test scores on large scale standardized tests, largely in just English and math. There are some other tested subjects, but those are the primaries. When this world is so complicated and beautiful and there's so, much, so many other disciplines to experience and learn, that those is what we've identified as the true north, and that the way we measure stu student achievement in those is through one test. And anyone who's ever taken a test, any kind of test, knows that assessment is just a proxy of what learning has actually gone on. And so if we know that these tests aren't even really that accurate of a reflection of what true learning is, or different kinds of learners, or how they might engage and demonstrate learning, then why are we using it as the true north to not just define success for students, but also define how successful teachers are in entire schools? And so what happens is we have a sort of entire culture shift that focuses on this is our determination of success. There are teachers who buck the system. And in fact, there's almost like this American folk hero of the rebel teacher who like closes the door in spite of all of these system signals and makes magic happen. But they're doing that in spite of the, 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 what the system is telling them to do. It's not, it's, they're not doing that work because they're supported or incentivized. They're doing it because that's the kind of teaching that they want to do and that's the kind of learning that they know makes a, makes a difference. But when we have this true north of a narrow definition of success using measures that are fundamentally flawed, it influences the way we use resources like on a basic level, what happens uh, to art classes when you have a school that's not performing well on standardized tests, the resources get moved over into increasing the test scores and there's less and less time for arts. Um, 
It sets some conditions, right? Like what are teachers receiving professional development? Like teachers are experts. They often have pro C-level creativity, but where are the kind of conditions that are being set for what they're expected to do as great educators, the, the conditions get focused on delivering this definition of success so very often. And there's so many perverse incentives. Like what happens to schools when they don't perform? The lowest 5%, they shut schools down. Or before they shut them down, they actually come in and do turnaround work where all the adults lose their jobs. So that makes adults act crazy, right? If you're looking at like, well, they're gonna, they're gonna fire me. I'm the, they're gonna move us all out and bring in a turnaround organization. Like, of course you're gonna focus on test scores despite what you know, like that's a deep incentive. But what happens when we shut down a school in a neighborhood? That's like another hour long talk that I can't get even, even get into, but the patterns of what neighborhoods and which students, the most severe consequences of this accountability system, these accountability ramifications fall on historic patterns of privilege. And what it also creates is a set of mindsets, right? When you have a test-based accountability system that has one right answer and you need to do it or else, that that's the, that's, that's the incentive, creates a mindset around like, like there is only one right answer and I'm afraid to fail. I, I need to get it right the first time. Did you all ever experience that? Like this notion of like that, there's not, that there, there is usually one right answer and that you have this sort of phantom in the background regardless of the school, the, what you're doing in the, during the day to day, that ultimately there's a need to achieve according to these measures. But I'm not gonna hold the K-12 accountability system entirely culpable because I actually think higher ed has a role to play here. It's like you think about what are the admissions criteria that you submitted that many of our most selective universities and colleges use. They are SAT and, and SAT and ACT, right? For the most part, it's English and math scores. And then what's the other measure? Your GPA. So like, there's a little bit of afraid to fail. Like, I'm not really worried about what I'm learning. I just gotta keep that GPA up or else I can't apply to the school I want or the school I wanna go to won't want me. Right, this sort of narrow definition of how we look at student success. And it has ramifications for students who are actually high achieving, who don't even have to worry about the state standardized test, but they're actually worried about their grades because they want to go to a good school and they're afraid to fail. And they get frustrated when teachers set them up to work a little bit. The teachers may give them space to fail when actually that's great teaching because the greatest learning we do is when we have stumbles and falls but we have mindsets and cultures from students, families, teachers, and leaders that has those two sort of like bounded compliance. There is right answer and there's no room to fail every, the, on the first try. So what are some creative bright spots? I'm getting there. I don't even, don't even know what time it is. I got time. Um, so what are some creative bright spots? So my work really is about lifting up the bright spots. People who are looking at these sort of conditions that are happening in schools and looking to flip them on their head. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a few of them. And so the first one is like New Hampshire. Like New Hampshire, what is that? Live free or die state? That's a little creative. But what they've done is they've designed a state accountability system that's not based entirely on large scale standardized tests where you sit in a room and you punch some answers. They've actually created what they call the PACE or the Performance Assessment for Competency-Based Education where students are actually doing really intense, extensive, multi-week projects uh, that's embedded in their classroom and the, the work that they do from that is used to inform how the state is defining quality in their schools. And with that, They've, the state has also identified and taken the bold move and saying, you know what, within the disciplines, these are, there, we know that there are other important skills for our students to be able to master. And so what they're calling them is they've identified four skills that they want all teachers in all schools to be focusing on and growing their students' potential in. And they call them the work-study practices. Um, it's communication, collaboration, self-directed learning, and creativity. So. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because the work study practices are important because it's based off some work that I did with some of my colleagues several years ago where we asked this question of like, so what are some skills 
And thinking back to the 4C model, like how could we develop them in school contexts? And what we used is this, what we call the Dreyfus model of novice to expert framework. So these brothers, right, they, the Dreyfus brothers, they were hired by the Air Force. The Air Force had a wicked question. How do we build, ex what are, how do we develop expert fighter pilots? What is the nature of skill acquisition? And they hired the Dreyfus brothers to look at, it's like, it's like, how do people become experts in a given skill? And they interviewed experts, you know, eminent geniuses within a skill area. And they interviewed fighter pilots, they interviewed jazz masters, chess masters, people who are bilingual. And they asked the story, what's the story of your skill development? Tell me how you got from there to here. And they had some really interesting insights. And so rather than me continue to talk at you, I'm gonna ask you to do something. So I want you to think about a skill that you have. And you don't have to be like, I'm a freaking expert on this, but like something that you're actually really good at. It could be baking, driving, you're really great at a sport or an instrument, like a skill you have. And think about your story. Like where did you learn how to do it? How did it grow over time? And all right, I'm gonna take a big risk here. Um, it's about to get really loud. I want you to turn your neighbor and one of you can share and just tell your story of your skill development. I'm going to give you like three minutes, so it's super quick. And here's the, here's the thing. It's only three minutes, so only one of you is going to get to talk, and I'm going to use the quiet coyote. So look for me when it's time to stop talking. All right, go. Quiet Coyote, all right, there we go. Thank you guys, you get some interesting skills. Did people, have, did people talk to a partner that had an interesting skill that they felt like they were an expert in? Anybody? Nobody? Shout one out, all right, you got it. Shout it out. Uh-huh. Yeah. creative thought development. All right, so uh, Bob gave me a ride from the airport yesterday and I asked him what his skill was. And so I'm gonna ask you a few questions about your skill. So what's your skill? I'm a relatively good table tennis player. Okay. And uh, how did you start playing table tennis? How did I start playing table tennis? Well, uh, the college I went to had, did not have a nice recreation center, but they did have a ping pong table in the basement of the dorm where I was living. And so um, rather than study, I suppose, I decided I'd learn to play ping pong, or at least go down and challenge myself to play ping pong. But I really wasn't very good at first. So how did you get better? I had to put a quarter on the table every time I wanted to play. And when your time came up, if you won, you got to stay on the table. And if you lost, the, peop the player who beat you kept your quarter. There was incentive for me to get better like real world currency. Um, so do you, would you say you have a, your own specific flair that you developed? Like how did you develop your approach to playing table tennis? This is going somewhere. 
promise. Okay. So, you know, to play table tennis competitively with the other members of the uh, dorm, I had to uh, work on, you know, how I held the paddle. I had to work on my eye-hand coordination. I had to work on learning to slam the ball, not just hit it back and forth. Okay, awesome. Hey, give me a high five. That was great. That's all, yeah, that's all I got. So Bob's story, you're like, what the heck? My skill is not table tennis. I don't understand what you're talking about, Chick. So Bob just told you a story of skill development that the Dreyfus brothers noticed that there were certain sort of common axes of development, certain ways that anyone who develops into an expert, there are certain ways and trajectories that people develop these skills. So the first one is just like moving from rules to analysis to in, uh, into, in, into intuition. That like at the very beginning, you're really just learning like, what the heck is this paddle? How do you hit it? What's the, person, what's the purpose of scoring the point? Into an analysis where you're really studying the way that these rules are applied. Like how do they play out? And eventually into intuition, where it's like, I just know how to hit the ball and it gets in there. There's another axis about time, like nobody is, an expert in any skill immediately. There are people that may have natural aptitude, but all expertise takes time to develop. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book about, called Outliers that talks about 10,000 hours. It's a like pretty interesting book that also confirms this axes of time. So the other idea is about context and, context and moving from controlled context to near transfer to far transfer. So I didn't get there with Bob, but I'll give you an example. What's something I'm really good at? I guess I'm a pretty good driver. Like, I'm really good at driving a car. Like, I don't have to think that much about it. Like, oftentimes I drive and you just get from one place to another, and that's just what I do. It's like I drive by intuition. But when I first started how to learning how to drive, I was in a very controlled context. My dad took me to a parking lot. Right? There wasn't a whole lot of other elements being thrown at me. I was really just learning the rules of how a car went and when it stopped. And then eventually it transferred over into a near transfer. Like, I actually think we drove on the, road, on the little trails in a cemetery next. And then you drive on a road. And then the far transfer you eventually get when you're developing expertise is that I can drive in Boston in the middle of a snowstorm in the middle of the night. Like, I wasn't ready for that far transfer context, but like I could start when I was starting in the parking lot. And you just like, think about how your skill development, like you start in a pretty safe space. And maybe that controlled context is you get a lot of coaching and a lot of support. And eventually the far transfer is you're doing it in a completely different place on your own direction. And the last one is this notion of tinkering to focus practice to fluid expression. The first year is kind of testing out, the Bob is like testing out how the, the paddle worked into focus practice that you're really working on this, that you're thinking and developing and like giving a lot of effort. And then eventually you just get into a, a state of flow, that this is your skill and, you, and it, it flows out of you as a fluid expression of something that you've developed over time. And this is an interesting framework that can be applied to lots of different kinds of skills. But it doesn't really look like that. It probably looks more like something like this, that it's a little bit more woven. It's not a straight line. Or in fact, it might look more like a tapestry, that when people develop expertise, it's not, uh, it doesn't look the same in everyone. Everyone brings their own unique imprint into that skill development. And it looks a little different, and it, and, and it includes lots of different woven components. And it doesn't really fit neatly into the way if you think about the way we develop and frame out our education system that has strict standards that move from one step to another to another. Um, so what we did is we wanted to use the Dreyfus model, like something that felt more developmental, that identified worthy learning and activity that happened at all different levels of learning, that you weren't just aiming and rushing to get to expertise, but there's something valuable and worthy experience that are happening at the earlier beginner levels that we're thinking about not necessarily like discrete categories of potential expression, but thinking about a whole skill. And we use this model to talk about and define things like creativity and collaboration and communication and self-directed learning. And we, the, the purpose of a framework in the associated learning community that we developed with thousands of teachers in both New Hampshire and then eventually Colorado and Wisconsin 
is that it was able, where teachers were able to come together to build a shared mental model about what creativity actually looks like and how it develops. Like nobody went to, very few teachers went to school to study how you teach creativity or teach creatively. So this was a like, pretty important moment for people, for teachers to come together and just like basic line, like what does this look like in development? And also do some reflection around their own creative self-confidence that lots of teachers don't think that they can teach creativity or embed it in their discipline because they don't believe themselves to be creative people. They don't see that their mini C, their little C, their pro C expressions of creativity to be creativity. Um, they were able to have conversations within their disciplines across years. So what does creativity look like in the context of a math classroom? And how might that develop? over time as students progress. Also interesting when teachers were able to have conversations with people across the disciplines. What does creativity look like in math? What does creativity look like in your science classroom? What are the common threads that we can find? Because our students are moving across these classrooms. So how are they building their own and seeing their own creative potential as we're offering and designing better learning experiences to foster creativity? And that design work was pretty important. This isn't just like a plug and play, you're gonna drop it off a menu and teachers were just gonna go about doing business as usual, that as teachers got deeper and deeper into these kinds of skills, like creativity, like collaboration, like self-directed learning, that they had to fundamentally rethink the way they devised learning experiences. That someone standing in front of a classroom talking and sharing their expertise might not necessarily always be the best learning experience. That they needed to give more open-ended projects, that students needed to have freedom to fail, but in a safe way where they can actually get feedback to revise and learn forward. Like, that's the big shift. And lastly, they thought of different ways for students to identify uh, evidence of product and process. That you're like, well, how do you show them my creativity, my creative work? So a lot of this is focusing on students talking about their own creative, how they apply creativity into a given uh, task that they were given in a classroom. So it isn't necessarily a teacher standing at back and going like, yeah, I guess that was kind of creative. I guess that's kind of unique and novel. What they were looking at for evidence of learning was for how students were describing the way they were applying creativity to the given problem or a given task in their classroom, which is a significant shift. So really quickly, because I'm running out of time, another way, another bright spot is Fairfax, Virginia. Um, so Fair Virginia has like a ridiculous number of standardized tests, like, I don't know, like 38, like lots of tests. They love standardized tests in Virginia, and Fairfax County is like, this is BS. This is sending all the wrong signals to what we know to be right for teachers and what we know to be right for students. And so what they did is they redesigned their high school graduation requirements, the diploma. Like what is it require, like what are our goals for our students when they leave? So the state can tell us what they value, but we as a community are gonna identify and articulate what are the skills our students need to be able to do when they succeed, and we devise an assessment process where students are gonna be demonstrating those skills. So the way they do it is through a capstone project where students devise and they and direct their own learning in the 12th grade, and they have to bring forth and defend their demonstration of things like creativity and collaboration and entrepreneurship. And that shifts the power from assessment being something that happens to students to being assessment that, that students are doing and owning themselves. It's a totally different shift from the way that Fairfax was operating in the past and a totally different way for how we even issue diplomas for the most part in this country. Most of the time, the reason why you graduated is because you sat in a chair a certain number of hours in certain subject areas. Like, that's the state law around graduation requirements. And in places like Fairfax are shifting the notion for the diploma to be a meaningful piece of paper that actually represents deep learning that their community values. And lastly, my friend Alec, the guy who talks about nerdy delight, he did some really interesting work around digital science badges, where they collaborated with biotech uh, scientists to say, like, what would the real world demonstration of the skill look like? And students aren't forced to do, to demonstrate these badges. The badges are sort of like the way like Boy Scout badges operate. They like, you earn this badge for a skill demonstration. But students opt into them completely. You can do it or you don't. But the currency that they represent has two ways. 
Students earn internships with local biotech scientists, and they use the badges as their resume. So there's real currency for students to look and see, like, what skills do I want to develop? How could I demonstrate that and show a potential employer what they can do? And they can earn college credit through the acquisition of badges. So like this notion of like shifting what our incentives are for how students are demonstrating the skills that they opt in instead of being forced, in, forced upon them and the way that they demonstrate in the, in the currency associated with them. All right, I know I'm running over, so I'm gonna get done. So lastly, I want you to think about creativity as equity work. Creativity is equity work. So this digital science badge work, it's happening in San Diego, California. It came, it came out of the Lago Academy where 75% of the students are Latino. 75% of them uh, speak Spanish at home actually and would be first generation college goers if they go to college. Most of them are living at or below the poverty line. This is not what the current biotech workforce looks like. So that's an equity play that they're changing the way that students can understand and demonstrate in a creative way how and what they know and can do in, in science and have it be a preparation for their uh, a potential future career. But it's also an interesting an example of how equity plays out in other contexts. When creativity is work, when, when, when the teachers in New Hampshire redesigned their system to think about skill development, and they realized that they needed to redesign their own learning experiences they constructed. What you see is like when you give space for creativity in a classroom, students are invited to show up and grow as their whole identity. They aren't just reflecting back the knowledge that you want them, the right answers they want them to say. They're reflecting back like their mini C and small C interpretations. It's they're, they're bringing to bear their whole self. They're invited to show up and make something. And when you, whenever any of you have ever made something, you feel your identity kind of embedded in that thing, right? That you're growing and showing that and showing yourself. And so much research says that the daily work of equity, that students are more likely to succeed, specifically students from historically underrepresented backgrounds, just for historically underserved backgrounds do better when they're invited, when their identity is honored and cultivated in their whole self. Similarly, that when you work and when you do creativity, that they feel a sense of being seen and known and having relationships in a classroom. That creativity work is like a way for, for kids to be seen, their own unique interpretation of the task that they've given rather than here's the answer that you asked me on a test. Like, here's myself, and in that I feel seen. And then if you remember, like, the creative work of, like, creativity isn't just an individual project pro process, it's the appreciation, the seen value. Sorry, I'm stemming. Um, that that is fundamental to building strong relations in a classroom. When students, when teachers are working on cr building creativity, they're also building relationships. And again, what the research tells us is that students are more likely to succeed. The students who are historically underserved by public schools are more likely to say, succeed, not because they got more math intervention, but because they have stronger relationships and creativity is a root there. And in that, they believe when people, then students can believe it when they say, people, when people say, I believe in you. Fundamentally, this is about equity work. And the way we're setting up our system right now, the story of Jimmy and Jonathan is the equity problem. That students are shut out from the opportunity to develop, that certain students are shut out from the opportunity to fulfill their creative potential. And we need to redesign the system to do so. So, here we go. What are you gonna think about tonight when you're brushing your teeth? Maybe you're gonna think about a little monkey scratching its back. Maybe you're gonna think about how you have many C insights, how you have pro C, what kind of pro C you wanna develop. Maybe you're gonna think about um, how you might recognize creativity in your professors as they're designing, designing learning experiences for you. But I'm really curious what you think. I'm honest, tweet at me, let me check it. Ta hashtag toothbrush test. I think it's interesting when we reflect back how we hear a talk and together create that little shared tapestry. But I just want to thank you all. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for passing the, the toothbrush test. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Who loves Symposium? Leave here, give a shout out. Woohoo! Who's coming back tomorrow for day two?
I, I was really happy that I had, uh, I got to say one of my talents is I think I'm a reasonably good listener. Why? Because when you listen to people, you find out how interesting they really are. I had the opportunity to listen to uh, one Greg Roxon uh, and also Robin Bloom Cahote uh, today. And uh, you're in for a real treat, whichever one of those you go to first thing tomorrow morning uh, in those two, uh, two sections. Those of you who um, are interested in the uh, special relationship community art project, fascinating project, proceed on to the church. I'd like to see all of you guys back uh, tomorrow, uh, 9 a.m. Thank you.